this video is starting off right where the previous one left off. And now we are actually going to get into fprintf. So I'm in my uh, part 040 input and output, and I'm gonna use control F. If you haven't seen this before, it works the same as it does in basically every other program, you know, Word, any sort of web browser, any sort of text editor really. And then uh, what it's gonna do is it's gonna open up the find menu. And then I can type in fprintf and hit enter. Actually, I don't even hit enter. I hit enter if I wanna go on to the next, uh, the next instance of it, which I do. So I'll hit enter. And I get down to line 155 here, uh, and we're gonna talk about fprintf. If you've used printf in some other programming language, Java or a C language, this is pretty much the same thing. fprintf is gonna use placeholders, such as %f, %d, and %s, for substituting values into a location in text. Now, I list these three because they're the most common ones that I use. You can Google printf placeholders and find more options if you need them for more exotic stuff. You can display stuff in hexadecimal or octal, all kinds of different options. These are the ones I tend to use, so that's what I'm gonna be talking about. %f is for floating point values. This is when you're trying to display out a number with a decimal point. %d, the d does stand for decimal, but I don't want you to think about like values with decimal places. What I want you to think of is base 10. So that's what decimal means. It means there are 10 digits. %d is for integers. Now, you can also use %i, but that's not how I learned it, and that just makes me make mistakes, so I use %d personally. But %i, I completely understand, like it's i for integer. That does work. %s is for strings, and string just means text. It's a string of characters. I like to think of it as like I have a little bit of thread, and I put alphabet soup like letters onto the thread, uh, and it's all strung together. That's what I envision when I uh, see the word strings there, if I'm trying to remember, like, why does that mean text? Continuing on down, I'm gonna run this section and then we'll talk about what the code does. Control Enter. All right, so I've got a variety of things displayed out. There's a bunch of somewhat weird blank spaces in here. We'll see uh, why that occurs in the code right now. So I've got a few variables with just various numeric values in them. And then I've got fprintf. And at first, fprintf kind of looks just like display. It's got parentheses, it's got single quotes, and then it's got some text to display out. Now, if you look at the details of that text, though, things get a little bit weird. Right between the word value and the word how is %15d. And if you look at what gets displayed out between the word value and the word how, it's a bunch of blank spaces and then this number right here. Now, the highlighted portion that I have is exactly 15 total spaces wide. That is what the 15 does in %15d right here. It's not putting in 15 blank spaces. In fact, I can tell you without even counting that this highlighted portion right here is 10 blank spaces because it's 15 total spaces, and five of those spaces are taken up by the number itself. Now, how did that number get there? Well, %15d is a placeholder. How do we determine what gets substituted into that placeholder? Well, it's just whatever's in the variable after the comma, after we close off the apostrophe for our string here. Backslash n is a special symbol simply meaning go down to the next line. Let me just demonstrate what happens if I don't have the backslash n and then you'll see why it's important. Almost always you want to put a backslash n at the end of each of your printfs. There we go. So I reran it without the backslash n's and what you'll see is that like all this text just appears one after the other after the other after the other on that top line and I have to scroll really far to read all of it instead of having it appear more vertically. So that's no good, I don't like that. Let's put the backslash ends back in. Okay, so let's just do it simpler. Let's get rid of the 15 and just do percent %d and rerun it. So now what we see is between the word value and the word how is the number that was substituted, the value of i that was substituted into that placeholder location. So that's the default behavior. And in a lot of cases, that's fine, right? Maybe we just want one space on either side. We could just put in blank spaces and then it's all good. However, a lot of times we want our numbers to line up nicely. Notice how these numbers, all their decimal places line up. How convenient is that, right? So that is one of the uses of using these numbers inside the placeholders. I could have just said percent %f on each of these instead of percent %15.2f. And if I run that, 
It displays out the values, with more accuracy even, but the digits aren't lined up, so it's harder to compare the numbers. So let's take it back to the way it was. 15.2 there, and rerun it. So for each of the substitutions, there's going to be 15 total spaces. Any extra beyond the width of the number itself, so this is four spaces, 4.25, four for symbols, there's going to be 11 blank spaces to the left. Now, I'm intentionally not highlighting this blank space because that one is literally typed in right here. So this is the extra blank space right here, right? So there's 15 in this placeholder, right? I've got blank spaces on either side, so there's going to be at least one blank space on both sides, guaranteed. There's actually a little blank space over here, but you can't really see that. I put that one in because it's easier to read, I think, especially for people who are unfamiliar with like the placeholders and the backslash n. They are separate. I don't want you to think that it's all one thing. The 15s, however, what they are doing is they are making sure that this highlighted portion is 15 total symbols wide. Same with this, same with this. And it's only filling in as many blank spaces as are needed because the number itself is taking up a bunch of those spaces. Then we have the point two. The point two is specifying how many decimal places we're gonna see. If I change them all to point one, and rerun it, then it only shows one decimal place. And by the way, it rounds. You don't have to worry about it just like chopping off the decimal place, it is rounding. Here's V, 385.269. The 26 here is rounded to three. Can we have more than one placeholder in an fprintf? Absolutely. It runs off my screen a little bit here, but here is an fprintf where we have the value and then a placeholder with one decimal place and another value after a new line character, percent point two f, and then two variables separated by commas that are going to be substituted in. The very first variable substituted into the first placeholder, second variable substituted into the second placeholder. And it displays out just like this. There was the first number with one decimal place. There's the second number with two. Here's an example with money. Let me run this code right here. So this is how we'd like things to display, because if I've got a whole bunch of prices that I want displayed, so for example, let's suppose that I've got price one, two, and three here. So here's one, two, and three, and the first one's 395, and the next one is 17, I don't know, 99, and the next one is 20.2, uh, right? So I've got these three prices, and I want to display them all out. Well, what I can do then, do price one, price two, and price three. Let's rerun it. All right, there we go. These are nicely displayed. The dollar sign is right next to the number, even though some of the numbers are different lengths. This one down here doesn't look as good. And you might think it would be fine. That code, the bad one, was generated with this line right here by just putting a dollar sign right out front of my placeholder and using a regular old fprintf. It's simple but it doesn't really look the way we want it to. And the reason why is I wanted 10 total spaces, but those spaces are gonna come between the number and the dollar sign, which is not totally ideal. So how did I do this? What I did was I used a different function, sprintf. So with sprintf, instead of fprintf, the difference is fprintf is going to print out our text somewhere, usually to the command window. And that's all we've seen so far although I will show you how to write it into a file. sprintf is not going to print this text anywhere. It's going to format the text, and then it's going to return it for capture into a variable for later use. So my trick here is that I use sprintf with a dollar sign followed by some formatting. I substitute the price in with the formatting I want, no spacing, no number and then point two, just the point two, just how many decimal places I want. And so, this text, if I display it out, now I'm actually going to display the third one out here, is this. The text value, dollar sign, 20.20. I can then use fprintf to substitute that text into a placeholder with 10 total spaces that is a string. It is not a number. And if I do that for each of my prices, then they all display out very nicely, their digits still align, and the dollar sign is right up close next to the number instead of having this awkward gap right here. So that's just a little trick to make your dollar signs look nice. So what if we run fprintf, but our variable has a matrix value? So we've got two rows and three columns here. What gets printed out, do we think? 
What actually happens is similar to an example I had earlier where I was using display with the uh, quotation marks and like plus the matrix. I don't know, the value, let's say. And it basically just printed out a bunch of copies of the text with each different number in the matrix. It's very similar to that. So let me go back to the way it was before. So these are the values from the matrix. Now, what's important to realize about this, though, is the order in which they are printed. You might expect that the one would be printed, then the two, then three, then three, then four, then five. That is not how it goes. Everything matrix related in MATLAB is column oriented. The one gets printed and then we go down to the three beneath it. And then we go to the next column, print the two, and then the four, and then three and five. And that is how fprintf works. Continuing on down, well, what happens if we have two placeholders and we're trying to print out this matrix X? What happens then? Well, what happens is the first number gets filled in the first placeholder, second number gets filled in the second placeholder, and then we just move on to the next two numbers and then the next two numbers. So in this case, here's column one, here's column two, here's column three. If that looks a little bit transposed to you, that's because it kind of is and that's gonna be relevant a little bit later on. Now there's all kinds of other questions we could ask. For example, what if there's four of these placeholders, but our matrix only has six values, what happens then? Uh, it kind of just gives up after it gets through the values that it has. So it prints out the four values, first four values, and then tries to go ahead and print more, but it runs out before the end of the matrix, and so it just stops, which I guess that's a choice for an implementation. A little bit surprising to me, that that's how it works but that is how MATLAB do. All right, next thing I'm gonna show you is how to use fprintf to display out a table of data, to display it in a tabular format, not using the table function, but using fprintf instead. Let me run the code first here. Now, what's very important about this code is that even though the table looks very nice, here is our table output printed by fprintf, the matrix itself, ooh, the output for the matrix is actually not very easy to read. And the reason for that is, in order to get the correct fprintf printout, the correct table here at the bottom, we need all of our data from one vector to be in the first row, all of our data from the next vector to be in the second row, and since we only have two columns, we only have two rows in our matrix. That's right. The matrix that we're setting up has two rows, but the table has two columns. And that is because by the way, I have a radius vector na uh, named r, and I have a vector of areas, uh, so pi r squared, so it's like a bunch of circle areas. And the reason that the matrix needs to have two rows for our table to look right is because what does fprint do with its two placeholders that it's got here? Well, the first placeholder is going to be the value in row one, column one. The second placeholder is going to grab the value in row two, column one. It's going to go down that first column before moving to the right. What is below the, the radius value of one? Well, it's the corresponding area. It's below it in the matrix, not to the side of it, but below it. Now here's the wrong way to do it right here. So don't do it this way, but do it that other way. Now, what's weird about this is my matrix output actually looks quite good. I have the first column with my radiuses, my second column with my areas. I do apologize. I actually forgot to redo my formatting when I started up this video and I started recording. I, I did this video in multiple parts. So anyway, format short G, format compact. That should set us back the way we want to go. Let me rerun that section. All right, there we go. So here's my matrix being printed out. The matrix looks okay. Column one has values one through 10. Those are my radiuses, my radii and the areas are there to the right. But when I use the exact same fprintf code as in the previous section to print out this data, it might look okay at first glance, but look more carefully. Is a radius one circle gonna have an area of two? Is any circle with a whole number radius gonna have an area with two zeros as its first two decimal places? Seems pretty unlikely since pi is involved. And I bet you can suss out what is happening here. All the radiuses are being printed first, and then all of the areas. That's not what we want. We want to go back and forth. We want to print this radius, its area, this radius, its area. But this radius right here, its area is actually right here. This is pi. It's just been truncated to no decimal places. 
So how do we fix this? And also, how did we even do this? Let's look at this code. The only difference between this wrong code and the correct code above occurs in this highlighted section right here. One difference is that I'm using a comma instead of a semicolon. And the other difference is that I'm transposing the radius and transposing the area to make my matrix have two columns, many rows, instead of two rows, many columns. Now, I actually kind of recommend doing it this way, but if you do it this way, you need one more fix to make the fprintf work properly, and that is to transpose the matrix down here. I actually kind of prefer writing out transpose rather than using the apostrophes, just because it's easier to notice. And now let me rerun this section. Now, this is the matrix just being printed out with just unsuppressed output on the command prompt. And the first column is the radiuses, the radii, and the second column is the areas. And my table also has that format. I did need three transposes, two here and one down here, but it does work and it does look good. And I think this is a good way to do it. Now, you might ask, well, why not just use the table function? And I give my students two answers to that question. One answer is that I want them to learn printf because a lot of other languages use it, and so it's just super useful to learn. And the other reason I give is because the table function doesn't give you as much control over your output. So here, it's harder to compare these numbers because their decimal places are not lined up. This is the output from the table function, from creating a table right here in a variable named t, setting its column headers, and then displaying it out. Above it, this is the output using fprintf and using these spacing formatters, all right? I want four spaces, no decimal places uh, for a floating point number. This is a bit silly, actually. I could just do a decimal number instead, an integer, percent %4d. And here, I want 11 total spaces, two decimal places with the floating point number, and that is actually really important to make sure these line up. And so I think in a lot of respects, this is better. It depends on what you're doing with it, right? Maybe you want to write your data out to an Excel spreadsheet. Probably having the table around is better for that. You want to display it out as text, though, and I think fprintf is actually superior. Now, earlier we asked, how do you display an apostrophe using the display function, since apostrophes are used as these, uh, are used as delimiters? And you would display them apostrophes in the same way with fprintf, but now there's also the question of, how do you display percentage signs? Well, good news, it's consistent. If you want to display one percentage sign, you just use two percentage signs. The reason why we might even expect there to be any problem with percentage signs is because the percentage sign is the left side of these special placeholders for fprintf. So let me actually run this section. All right, the interest rate is 0.05%. That's actually probably not accurate. It would probably be 5%, not 0 0.05. Anyway, you get the idea. It's two percentage signs to display it, not a single one. That's not going to work. And in fact, it doesn't like break anything. It just kind of gives up on the printing. Um, so now I'm printing both of these. And so it's printing the first one and where it's supposed to have the percentage sign, it just kind of gives up and then starts printing the other one with no error. So that's a little bit frustrating. I almost wish it would give the error so that we would know we did something wrong. All right, next up, I'm going to generate a table from user input and display it out with fprintf. I'm sort of consolidating all the things that I've been showing in this section. Let's actually talk through the code first, I think. So I display out some text, and then I have three input functions. The first one asking for a starting number in degrees, the final value in degrees, and then the increment, the step size. And so I get those into three different variables. And then I use those variables with the interval notation, colon here, to get a vector of values in degrees. And then I'm gonna convert those values to radians, get a corresponding vector of radians, put it all together into a matrix in two rows. So degrees on the first row, radians on the second row. And then I'm gonna display it out in two columns with fprintf. There are two placeholders here. There's percent 10.0f and there's percent 16.4f. This is a perfectly reasonable way to do it. I know for like beginners, it might be a little harder to read. If it's easier for you to like put spaces in, in my class at least, you can do that. Just be aware that the spaces will appear in your output, guaranteed, right? They are between the apostrophes, so those spaces will show up in the output. Anyway, let me resize my window and run this section. So 
Uh, we're going to create a table of degrees to radians. Enter a starting number of degrees, I don't know, 90, let's say. Enter a final value of degrees, let's say 270. What table increment would you like? Let's go with 45. And there is our table with degrees on the left and radians on the right. Pi over 2, pi right there. Uh, that's 3 pi over 2, although I certainly don't recognize that from sight, but that's what it is. Great. And now I'm going to show you how to use fprintf to write data out to file. Now we need two new commands, two new functions for this section. We're going to use fopen and fclose. Now fopen takes as input, it's a function, it takes as input a file name and then a specifier on how are we going to interact with this file. If I say wt, it means I am writing to a text file. If I'd use RT, it would mean I'd be reading from a text file. If I used AT, it means I would be appending to a text file. In other words, if the file already has text in it, I'm just going to add text after that. There's a very important difference between AT and WT. The WT is going to replace any text that was previously in the file the A is going to just add to the end of the file additional text that you print to it. I've named my file myoutputfile.txt for no particular reason. If you look in the upper left, you will see that that file does not yet exist. I need to set a variable equal to the result of fopen. This variable is going to contain what is called a file handle, which I think is a fairly good uh, description of what it does. It lets you get a grip on a file, like other handles let you get a grip on whatever the handle is attached to. Now, once I have this file handle, there's a really easy change that I make to my fprintf. Instead of fprintf and then whatever I'm printing out and anything inserted into the placeholders, I also, right before that, at the beginning of the parentheses, I put in the variable containing that file handle, and then a comma, and then the text itself. And when I'm finished, I call fclose on the file handle to say I am done with that file. So we'll keep an eye on the upper left-hand corner, uh, as I run this code here. And there it is. The file appears. Nothing appeared in the command window. Nothing was printed out over here. These fprintfs sent their output to the file handle. Let's go open that file up. There's a file right there. I'm going to open it in Notepad++. Uh, that's what I use. All right, and here is that text right there. So that's what I printed out with fprintf. And let's, let's check it out. If I change the wt, to AT. No, I'm sorry, I actually ran it but with AT that first time. I didn't even intend to do that. So if there's no file that exists and you run it with AT, it will be the same as WT. Uh, let's run it again. Control Enter. You can't even tell by looking at my screen that I just ran it again. But if we open it up here, Notepad tells me, hey, this file has been modified. Do you want to reload it? I say yes. Oh, look, it's printed out that same data again to this file. Now, if I change this to WT, and run it again. Nothing appears different here, but I go to Notepad, it says, oh, it's been modified again, and look at the data in it, and I say yes. There it goes. It replaced all the text that was there with the new text being written to the file. So I think this is relatively easy, the use of file handles with fopen and fclose. Um, it's the same syntax for the fprintf, as long as you just, like, if I just get rid of the file handles here, exactly what was in that file will be printed out to the command window instead. And there it is right there. So I think that's pretty convenient and uh, pretty easy to use. Here's another example with uh, sprintf or sprintf if you like, but really the s stands for string. I believe by the way that the f at the beginning of fprintf stands for file because I can write to file where I have that file ID there. Um, and I believe the f at the end of fprintf stands for formatting or formatted. So I'm uh, printing to a file formatted text. With the sprintf, I am creating a string. I'm printing to a string, I guess you might say. Uh, again, formatted text, since all the exact same formatting that works in fprintf works for sprintf. Let me run this section first and show you what it does, and then we'll talk through it. All right, so it generates this figure right here, and this text, the maximum range was 1,020 meters, was created using sprintf. So let's look at the code that did that. So I got a gravity variable, g of 9.8, velocity of 100. We're doing a basic parabola, parabolic motion problem. I got a set of uh, theta angles that I might be launching a projectile at. And then I figure out what's the range? How far does my projectile go? 
with these various different thetas. Do my calculation right there. I do recommend using the dot operators unless you're sure that you're using matrix multiplication. It worked out here because literally everything other than the theta is a, a scalar variable, a variable that's just one value, but I still kind of recommend putting them in, especially if you're a little new to MATLAB, it won't hurt. I use the max function to figure out what is the maximum range, where are we going to get our best uh, distance for our angle that we use. And then I use sprintf on the next line, it does run off my screen a bit right here, to generate a string and put it into this variable named text input. And the string is going to be the maximum range was placeholder, number of meters, new line. The new line's not actually necessary since I'm putting it on a graph. That's, I don't know, it's a good habit to be in. And then I'm going to substitute the value of the maximum variable into that placeholder location. Again, I'm not sure why exactly I'm doing 0.0f, as in zero decimal places, but it's a floating point. Seems like I could just do an integer and get the exact same result, and I promise you that if you do, you will get the exact same result. So then I plot my angles and my ranges that I end up with, give it a title, x label, y label, and then I use the text function to put at this x coordinate, this y coordinate, the text that I got from sprintf. And so this 10, 1020, you can see the text right here. The left side of the text begins at the uh, x-axis value of 10, y-axis value that looks pretty close to 1020, and then it displays off to the right. Continuing on down, the char function. I didn't know where else to put this, so I, I'm going to fit it in right here. The char function can be used to nicely insert text data into our tables. So let me run this section, and then I'll talk more about the code itself. All right, so here's a nice little table right here, literally using the table function, and Earth, Moon, and Mars fit nicely alongside numeric data. Now, you might say like, okay, well, why, why wouldn't they fit nicely? Why would I expect that to be different? Well, consider this alternative right here. So this is not as nicely formatted. It has these curly brackets and apostrophes, and that's just, that's just not what we want to see when it's not necessary. Now, you might have seen me working through that really, I sped up the part of the video, but you might have seen me working through that and I had this and it actually did work nicely. So why, why not just do that? Why not just use easy square brackets? Um, I did use semicolons here to stack them vertically rather than a comma to put them side by side. But like, why not just use the square brackets? Why I have to memorize that there's this char function? Well, because this other thing that I did, I put extra spaces right here after moon and Mars. Like, why did I do that? Well, because if you don't have those spaces, you get a vert cat error. Dimensions of arrays being concatenated are not consistent. Why? Well, because Earth is five letters and Moon and Mars are four letters. So when you stack them vertically, the H is like hanging off the end. It doesn't have any buddies. You might think, okay, well, that's fine. Just remember to just punch the space bar a couple times and then make them the right length. Sure. But what if instead of just three values, you had hundreds of values, or even just a hundred, and they're all different lengths? Are you just going to go through and punch the space bar as many times as you need? No. You need to know that the char function exists. Uh, it's useful. Just use that, right? Is basically, and what it's doing for us here is basically just creating this vector uh, automatically and putting in blank spaces where they are needed. But that's automation, right? That's what we want. We want to make our lives easier. Great, so there it is. That's really all I'm demonstrating in this function. Char function, you put in the text that you want separated by commas, it'll give you a vertical vector of the text. It's actually a matrix secretly, but let's go with a vertical vector that you can put into your table function and display out nicely. Now, another little difference I did here is instead of using the t.properties.variable names to set the column headers, I used in the table functions inputs, in the parentheses here, variable names, comma, titles. Now I'm just using the dot, dot, dot to go down to the next line here. I could have done this all on one line. It's just a little bit harder to fit on the screen. So that's the only thing the dot, dot, dot solves. In fact, it might even be easier to do it here. Eh, a little bit better probably. But yeah, this is another way you can set those column headers. And I strongly recommend either using properties.variable names or this because otherwise you'll be limited in what sort of column names you can use. You won't be able to do column headers that have spaces or special symbols in them if you're always limited to whatever your variable names are. Now, like I was saying, this right here is an alternative to just using properties.variable names, which I demonstrate 
right down below, right here, setting it equal to titles. And titles is just a list of strings uh, wrapped up in curly brackets. Note, that is a little bit of a difference. This is what not to do. And I, I just showed it earlier, but I'll show it again right here. That's what not to do. Don't just use the curly brackets all by themselves. And that's all for this video. In the next one, we'll move on to uh, writing uh, tables and various other things out to file using like write table and write matrix.